Thank you. Um, well, I've forgotten that a lot of you uh, may have read bad thoughts. So, the, this talk is about half of it is about half of the chapter in bad thoughts about the fact, in my opinion, that you don't have a right to your own opinion. And the other part of it is kind of extending that to the current politics of belief. Um, so, uh, I hope it works. Uh, I hope the familiar bits won't be too boring for you. And also, I haven't been out of academia for a long time. I haven't been on all um, modern, so it's just you know old school reading it from bits of paper. So about half the women uh, I know or I meet ask me what star sign star sign I am. Uh, I used to take this as an opportunity to set them straight. I point out uh, that the theory of astrology is extremely implausible given what we know about the world. Uh, and what's more, that it's been tested and refuted. At least uh, that's what I would do when I wasn't looking for a girlfriend. <laughs> but it was a waste of time. I never changed their minds, I just annoyed them. Indeed, they would often accuse me of trying to violate one of their rights, namely their right to their own opinions. Everyone seems to believe in this right. The idea that we do not simply hold our beliefs, but that we're entitled to hold them, is a truism of modern democracy. But like most truisms of modern democracy, it's false. We're not really entitled to our opinions, nor should we be, because such an entitlement is the enemy of intellectual progress. It creates a kind of intellectual protectionism, analogous to economic protectionism, that restricts the free trade in ideas, and with it, intellectual progress. That is what I aim to show uh, in the remainder of this talk. So to see what's wrong with the idea that we have a right to our opinions, we need to only understand one basic point about rights, namely that rights entail obligations. Uh, now, as a little aside, I, I'm not here talking about the new labor idea that with rights come responsibilities. That idea is the idea that I, kind of, I pay for my right. I get a, a right as a kind of privilege which I pay by being a responsible person. That's not at all what I mean. I mean the traditional classical idea about rights in, in jurisprudence, which is that rights are defined by the corresponding uh, duties of others. So consider an example. The law gives us all a right to life. The right to life means that everybody else has a duty not to kill you. This is not something that the government may or may not uh, choose to associate with your right to life. It is that right. A law that did not impose on others a duty not to kill you would thereby fail to establish your right to life. Does your right to life mean that others have a duty to feed you, to house you, to provide you with medical care? These are hotly debated questions, but nobody doubts that the answers to those questions about others' duties are what define and delimit your right to life. So when anyone claims a right, the first question you ask is, what duties is this right supposed to impose on others? That will tell you what the right is supposed to be. It will also be a good test whether there is or should be any such right. For it will often be clear that no one really has the implied duties, or that it would be preposterous to claim that they should. I once heard uh, an Australian government minister say that every child has a right to be loved. Uh, but who could possibly have a duty to love every Australian child, or even a duty to love a single child? Of course, it would be nice if every child were loved. But that is irrelevant. The fact that something would be nice to have, such as long eyelashes or $10 million, does not mean that anyone has a duty to provide you with it, nor, therefore, that you have a right to it. What, then, are the duties that the right to your opinions might entail? So here we should distinguish between two <coughs> types of right. There are claims, which are sometimes known as entitlements, or positive rights, and there are liberties, which are sometimes known as negative rights. If you have a claim on something, then others have a duty to provide you with it. If your right to life is a claim against the state, for example, then the state has a duty to provide you with the means to live, food, shelter, health care, etc. A liberty is a weaker kind of right. If you're at liberty uh, to do something or have something, such as a life, then others have a duty not to actively deprive you of it. If your right to life is merely a liberty, then others must not kill you, but nor need they feed you or house you. 
Now, getting back to beliefs, the idea that we have a claim on our beliefs is uh, hardly makes sense. How can others be obliged to provide you with certain beliefs? I have to believe that I'll never die. But who owes me this belief? Who should I sue if I fail to get it? If we have a right to our opinions, it must be a liberty. The right must mean that others have a duty not to, change, not to force us to change our minds. Now, you may be sympathetic to this idea. You may think that no one should force anyone to believe anything. But it's a hopeless idea, because the only way to get beliefs is to have them forced on you. Believing something is not a matter of choice. You can test this for yourself. Try to believe something that you don't now believe. For example, that you're the King of England, or that you can fly. I'll give you a minute. Just try. You see? You can't do it. You didn't give us a whole minute. So. Give you a minute. If anyone thinks they can pull it off, I will wait. Okay. Believing is not like dressing. You can't pick the beliefs that suit you. Believing something is more like getting freckles. Stand out in the sun and they are forced upon you, at least if you have skin of the right sort. Beliefs are not forced on you by threats of violence or other penalties. That kind of force, political coercion as I'll call it, cannot change what you believe. If I threaten to feed you to the lions if you do not believe, if you do not give up your belief that London is in England, you may say that you no longer believe it, but the threat will not have actually removed your belief. You will merely be lying to save yourself. Beliefs can be acquired or changed only in certain ways. Most often, they are forced on you by the interaction of your sense organs with reality. Few of you will now believe that I have a large tattoo of, of Hillary Clinton on my belt. But if I were to open my shirt and reveal one, you would soon believe it and with no choice in the matter. <laughs> <laughs> Um, even, even when beliefs are not acquired directly from our senses but are arrived at by a process of uh, evidence and arguments, uh, it is still not a matter of choice what we end up believing. Either the evidence and arguments convince us or they, do, or they do not. We cannot choose how our minds will react any more than we can choose whether, whether the sun will freckle our skin. To carry this metaphor a little further, we can of course choose whether to expose our skin to the sun. Uh, and we can equally choose what kinds of issues we consider. It's a slightly different point. Having done that, we can't then choose if we get freckled, and we can't then choose what beliefs we end up with. If, we, you know, if I look out the window, I can't help but believe there are some yellow flowers out there. But I didn't have to look out the window. Okay, now, where was I? So, in short, our beliefs, our beliefs are not formed and changed by threats or bribes or any other kind of political coercion. They are formed and changed by the force of argument and evidence, including what comes straight to us through our sense organs. So, a right to hold your beliefs is not a protection against political coercion. It is a protection against evidence and argument. It obliges others not to prove you wrong. That is why we cannot have both a right to hold our opinions and a right to express them, or at least why these rights are at odds with each other. If you are to respect my right to hold my beliefs, you must not say anything that might force me to change my mind. The right to your opinion creates what I call intellectual protectionism. It shields beliefs from competition with other beliefs in the way that economic protectionism, subsidies, tariffs, and so on, shield companies from competition with other companies. And just as economic protectionism promotes waste because it prevents inefficient companies from going out of business, so intellectual protectionism promotes falsity because it shields false beliefs from public refutation. The idea that people are entitled to their opinions is an enemy of intellectual progress. That is why it's not just a silly idea, but a dangerous one. If you consider ordinary, everyday beliefs, the idea that people violate our rights by changing our opinions is clearly absurd. No one thinks that there either is or should be <coughs> such right. In such matters, no one is an intellectual protectionist. Consider a simple example. Uh, this is from the book. You're about to cross the street with a friend. A car is coming. Yet your friend still takes a stride into the street. 
Knowing that she's not suicidal, you infer that she believes no cars are coming. Are you obliged to let her keep this opinion? Obviously not. You ought to take every reasonable measure to change her opinion, perhaps by drawing attention to the oncoming car, saying, look out, a car is coming. By doing this, you have not violated her, her rights. Indeed, she'll probably thank you. The list of matters on which no one seeks protection for their beliefs is almost endless. No one will complain if you tell them that the butter is not where they think it is, or the point out that they've failed to receive all the change they were owed, or that they have a crumb on their lip. Yet on certain matters, people do claim, uh, do take the alleged right to hold an opinion seriously. Some beliefs are deemed special, and their robust scrutiny is constrained, either by good manners, or by corporate codes of conduct, or in some cases, by the law. The culture of respect for those beliefs that are associated with our identities means that some, uh, someone with utterly preposterous beliefs can go through life, including a university degree, without having them seriously challenged. In America, though the law defends freedom of speech, cultural convention stifles it. It would be a very brave employee in the New York office of my company, for example, who entered into serious debate about religion or sexuality in the lunchroom. He would almost certainly become a social pariah, and he could even lose his job. The former president of Harvard University, Larry Summers, lost his job for, amongst other things, uh, making a speech in which he said that there are relatively few female physics professors because relatively few women have the peculiar mental capacities required. Uh, this is simply unsayable. Research suggests it's true, but the belief that there are no statistical differences, intellectual differences between men and women is protected, not by law perhaps, but by the customs of the educational establishment. Part of knowing how to get ahead professionally is knowing which beliefs are protected and which are not. When Larry Summers made that catastrophic speech, many must have wondered how he could be such a fool. Not for believing what he does about women in physics, but for saying it out loud. This protection of culturally sensitive beliefs is not restricted to America. In 2006, in my own country of New Zealand, an attempt to get genetic information to plot the ancient migration of the ancestors of Polynesians from Asia down uh, into the Pacific ran into trouble. But you know about these kinds of, the way they work out, they can track through genes where people have come from. So they were trying to do this with the, uh, the Polynesians, which is the most recent race on Earth uh, to, to emerge. Anyway, uh, this program of research ran into trouble in New Zealand because Maori political activists uh, Maoris, for anybody who doesn't know, are uh, the indigenous New Zealand uh, Polynesians. So Maori political activists uh, encouraged other Maoris to deny the researchers anything contained musical genetic information, such as a blood sample or a scrape of mouth tissue. A lecturer in Maori studies at an Auckland University claimed that the genetic research was a kind of intellectual imperialism. Maoris already knew perfectly well where they came from, for their legends tell them. According to that, this scholar, serious research should be stifled so that myths about men fishing up continents with their grandmother's jawbone and being crushed in the vagina of the earth mother could be preserved as the literal truth. Maoris have a right to believe whatever they want about their own history without any interference from science. As usual, the law lags behind the cultural elite, but it is catching up. A recent United Nations uh, Human Rights Council resolution, sponsored by the United States and Egypt, which is a strange, strange bedfellows, declared that everyone has a right to hold his opinion without interference and warned against stereotyping of religions and cultures. This was a watered down version of a draft that had prohibited the denigration of religions. In Britain, inciting religious hatred and inciting hatred on account of sexuality, have recently been criminalized. And as you'll probably know, the leader of the BNP has in fact, uh, has a conviction for inciting racial hatred. Like me, you probably dislike racism and prejudice against homosexuals. But you should like the protection of your beliefs even more. 
Because once the idea that intellectual protectionism, sorry, once the idea of intellectual protectionism is accepted, all sorts of people will seek it for their ideas. And as with economic protectionism, those who get preferential treatment will be those who need it and, and those who can lobby successfully. The companies that need protection from competition are those that are inefficient. But only the big ones, such as General Motors or the Royal Bank of Scotland, have the political influence uh, required to get protection. So perversely, the more resources a company wastes, the more likely it is to be protected. Similarly, intellectual protectionism will be sought by people with obviously false beliefs, and it will be achieved, and, and the protection will be achieved only when the belief is shared by enough people or by important enough people to give it political influence. So perversely, the more widespread an error, the more likely it is to be protected. The answer is not to be careful about giving only true beliefs protection. That is never how political protection works, the politics of protection works out. And true beliefs don't need protecting anyway. The answer is to give up on the whole idea. The answer is to deny that anyone has a right to his opinion. Thank you. specifying quite a lot about beliefs, which beliefs are protected, and trying to characterize beliefs. Uh, and it, I think it's taken a position a bit like yours, which is to say beliefs are, so it had various tests for which beliefs would be protected and which wouldn't. So the, the principal test for whether a belief was of the protective variety was that it could have a profound effect on the way you lived your life. And so on that basis... So it's almost like a faith. Yeah, it's kind of a... Like, it, it's got something to do with your identity or something like that. Or, you know, it has a, it, it's, you know, if I think that, you know, if I, what I think the capital of Ninth Niger is, I have no belief about it actually, but you know, that, if I just got changed my view about that tomorrow, it wouldn't change anything about how I live my life. Whereas if I went from being uh, a Christian to an atheist, that might be a big deal. That's what they're trying to get at. Um, so, and I think they're all, just, frankly, I think they're all the same class of psychological state. They have different effects on you, I agree, but they're all just beliefs. Um, but there's still some distinction, obviously. We can draw a distinction. Um, but the important question is, well, so what? Should those more important beliefs be get protection? And in fact, I think their very importance are useful not being protected. I mean, if they're going to have a very profound effect on people's lives, if they, society is shaped by them, People, for example, uh, change what they eat, who they associate with, all that stuff. So they need, they need to be open to uh, rigorous scrutiny. So, I, though there's a distinction there, I just think it's important. Well, um, if we start now making a philosophical point about what it means to talk about belief. Um, and you said that uh, the notion that we have a right to our beliefs is, is false. Uh, well, I would have thought that that might say could be that it's something unintelligible. Uh, just because uh, beliefs are things we just simply choose. So, um, so the, the whole idea of, uh, of hanging around to hold on to one's beliefs it, uh, seems in this way unintelligible. But then, uh, but, I mean, given that point, uh, it seemed then to move into to a kind of worldview where we would say that, that certain ways of Certain politics of belief are better than others, right. and, uh, and I, uh, 
I wonder about that move. I mean, how do you derive a certain, a certain okay. ideological standpoint from a logical problem? Well, actually, I, so it goes, the, the thinking goes like this. I agree with you that it's actually quite difficult to even make sense once you out of the idea that you have a right to your beliefs. Once you understand how beliefs are formed and got rid of, it doesn't look like something where rights and duties and all that kind of thing even arise. Yet, there is the slogan that you have entitled to your beliefs. It's used a lot, and it's, when it, it's used in the context of the politics of belief, basically. So when, and I use politics in the broadest sense of the word. So when there are uh, issues arising, there are many issues that arise in everyday life and in society and in politics about uh, whether or not beliefs can be, what can be said, what, whether beliefs should be protected, privileged. I mean, some beliefs are actually privileged, right? I mean, they get sponsored by the government. You know, there are subsidies for some beliefs, and there are taxes on other beliefs and so on. So, so I, I'm saying there's this attitude out there, even if it doesn't make much sense ultimately philosophically. And I, so I, I, my transition was, this idea isn't just silly, it's dangerous. So it's, so well, first I've got to establish that it's false. It just isn't even true. And then I want to say, moreover, the kind of politics that follow from the idea are pernicious. The two parts are not that closely connected. Uh, it's just that if you were true that you had a right to your opinion, then that would be a justification for the politics. So I've got to get that out of the way, and then we can discuss the politics of belief. Let's put it this, this way. Now, you, you, we might imagine someone who, who advocates a ban on racial hatred on the basis that, first of all, uh, racism is factually wrong or ethically objectionable, and all views which are objectionable or um, or uh, wrong must be banned. But now, now I don't think this is a typical motivation behind uh, that uh, suggestion. But rather, I mean, you know, suppose there is a group which holds uh, factually correct views. They are dead right, and um, and then they use violence in order to uh, to suppress. Uh, and bully everyone uh, else to silence. Then, of course, that's that's a good reason for uh, banning that sort of groups or banning their propaganda. So, so in a sense, racial hatred here is not an opinion, but part of a campaign to intimidate others. Uh, then, then, one more point uh, concerning blasphemy. Now, now I don't blasphemy. blasphemy. Now, now, I don't have any clear suggestion about what to do about blasphemy, but I think we should realize here that all cases of blasphemy are not cases of expressing one's opinion. Uh, I mean, for instance, if, I mean, if there's a caricature uh, uh, depicting uh, Mohammed, uh, Prophet Muhammad uh, in, a, in an obscene way, in an obscene picture, I can't see what, what's the opinion that's being expressed by this caricature. I mean, obviously, the point of the caricature is to, to, to provoke people and, and probably to provoke um, something that shows that the others are um, intolerant. So, so clearly, this is not the case of, of an expression of opinion. Okay, so there are two points. The second one. Is the harder case for me? I'll come across that second. The first one. Um, <clears throat> if some, if you, it is illegal already. It was illegal before these laws to incite uh, violence. Mm -hmm. So if you were to incite people to act violently against pe anybody, doesn't matter if, why, that's a crime. Uh, so it seems to me that the law is adequate to deal with the cases we want to deal with anyway without bringing in. These laws do something very peculiar. They're actually very odd as laws. So incitement laws are normally where they make it a crime not just to do something, but also to incite others to do it. The really fascinating things about the, about the incitement to hatred laws is that the thing that is being incited is not in itself illegal. You are allowed to hate people because they're black. You're just not allowed to incite hatred. It's very strange as a, as a law. Um, 
I, mean, I can't think of any other case where the thing being incited is legal, but the inciting isn't. Um, now, so I, I think the law is actually adequate. The laws we already have are adequate to deal with cases that we would want to deal with. Like, you know, people going around attacking people because of their, or harming them in any way, that's illegal already. Now, I think that you're getting, the, is, I, we're not moving off opinions now just onto liberalism in general, but I think the case of hurt feelings, let's say, uh, is the hardest case to deal with. So, let's so we, we we want to be we want to say we want to say two things. People should be allowed to say whatever they want, and also people shouldn't harm other people. <coughs> two general principles, and they can come into conflict because sometimes you hurt people by saying certain things. So you hurt their feelings, or you agitate them. You know, so when I when I start to when Richard Dawkins, let's say he's changed, he's, un, he's successful in argument, some Christian starts getting agitated because he's been exposed to all these arguments and he feels unhappy. You know, should we? Some harm has been done. So you might say we've got a general principle about not harming others that means there are proper constraints on saying things because they just they cause harm. Now, I, I've got, I th think that what's ha happened over the last, say, 20 years is that that idea that people's feelings must be taken, like hurt feelings or psychiatric kind of harm, psychological, yeah, psychiatric, correct, psychiatric harm, psychic harm, that, the, that our actions should be constrained, the law should constrain our actions so as to prevent us causing psychic harm. That's really taken off, that idea. Um, and I don't think it would have got far 50 years ago, now it gets quite a long way. And people play up to it, of course, you know, all sorts of, all sorts of pressure groups go around wailing, moaning, they go on the streets and yell and so upset that people have hurt my feelings. But it's really hard to know just how much harm has really been done here. And in fact, I'm inclined to think that they're enjoying it. All those people out there whose feelings have been, you know, their religious sensibilities have been roughed up and they claim to be, you know, very upset, I think they're having a whale of a time and they're enjoying the testing of their faith. So I wouldn't take these claims very seriously in the first place as involving serious harm. But more important than all that is that, is that these, little, these momentary feelings of pain and loss and hurt feelings, well, they are nothing compared to the importance of the advance of ideas and the truth and broad principles of liberty. You're some, yeah, these are, this is the engine of progress, and some group of fools with hurt feelings should stand in the way, we should pander to this. It seems to me, uh, just shows no sense of proportion, and no principles, and no commitment to the things that caused, uh, caused us to be, maybe not great, but pretty good, as, as things are. So, that would be my response uh, to those things, yeah, just tough, basically. Noticed over the years, and uh, perhaps many have, that my, my students don't use belief and opinion interchangeably. And in trying to figure out what's going on with this, what I've come to believe, though I'm not sure this is true, is that they like the phrase, I've got to write my opinion, because they hold a kind of inchoate form of the fact value distinction, and they're relevant, and they're relativists about value. So I have a and they're relativists about value. Right. And so, you know, they don't like you described as having the opinion that two plus two equals four. Right. For instance. Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, I think you're right. That is a nice point. In fact, uh, in uh, one of the chapters of Bad Thoughts, I discussed matters of, matters of opinion. This is a matter of opinion. And so, uh, yeah, so they're, they're almost by definition for a lot of people, if it's a matter of opinion, then there's no right answer. And so then, of course, you can have any opinion. No opinion is better than any other opinion, so why can't I just have this one? It's just like getting dressed. It's like it's just a matter of taste, but so don't mess with my style. So I think you may be, well be right about the uh, the what's going on kind of in, in that. So you're probably right. Uh, but and maybe for some small. I mean, I still I think coming up to your point that it's crazy even to talk about. If it's really like that, then talk of rights and duties and all this kind of this place. But I guess it, you can kind of get a rough sense of what they mean. And for those, if you think, I'm not sure personally where the limits of fact lie. Uh, but if, you know, if there is a, 
bunch of stuff that, where in some sense you do have beliefs or opinions, but there aren't any corresponding, there's nothing really corresponding to them, then I guess, yeah, go for your life, think what you want. Right. Yeah. <coughs> Two questions, please. There are some minor points that I may very well have misunderstood. Um, at the end, you said true belief does not need protection. And my only question is simply why not? And the other one relates, I think, what opinion and belief we had before. And you have said something like, uh, we do not or cannot choose to believe. And then you pointed to observation and said, like, the flower is there and I cannot deny it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if so, then the question would be does it extend to evaluative belief or to framing? And should you go for no? How would you explain a successful practice such as uh, neuro linguistic programming where people actually choose what they want to believe? Oh, yeah. That's the case, end up with the belief that they have. Okay, so two. Um, can I do that one first? And then I'll come back to yeah. why the truth doesn't need to um, So I, I, this, I have to now qualify all this stuff. So you can affect, you can make choices that affect what you believe. So if I. Um, as I said, where I, I can choose what information to expose myself to, uh, and I can anticipate, <coughs> and I might choose not to, precisely to avoid getting certain beliefs that I don't want to get. I did this. For example, often when I go to the cash machine, uh, I don't look at the balance. Right? So, I'm just going to look at my so I look away. Right? So that's the kind of, I'm affecting, I'm choosing not to know what my bank balance is. And so you can definitely do that. Uh, but, the reason I look away is that I know that if I saw the little numbers, I would be sure to get the belief. Right? So it's because I know that it would be irresistible to me. I couldn't look at it and not believe that it was you know, 3,000 pounds overdrawn. So um, that's, so I do agree that you can, the other thing you can do is things like, as you mentioned, the what NLP or whatever. Actually, um, Pascal, uh, or Pascal's wager brought this up even before NLP was invented. So he said you can't choose directly what you believe, you can't just choose to believe in God. But if you go to church every weekend uh, and you do it for long enough and you pray and you say all these things, you just go through the motions, you may find that after a few years you really do believe in God. And there does seem to be some truth in something like that. Uh, what I meant was, uh, so what I meant was the, the sense that Pascal first said you can't. Yeah, you can't just choose, just bang, choose. And also, and the really important point for my article is, you can't have it, you can't be coerced into it. And, and well, you could be, you could over a very long period of time, I guess, if your parents took you to church every week and you had to, you know, you, the incantations and that kind of thing. But, you know, the kind of, the idea that ordinary citizens are vulnerable to political coercion that will force them into changing their minds. I mean, the only way I can see that that would work is if they were presented with extremely good evidence that their views were false. And that would be a good thing. That would be great. That, that's a, you're, you're giving them a gift. Um, it, I don't see that there's any, you can't threaten people into it. That's what matters, right? There's nothing that you would want to protect people from, like threats or bribes you don't need to protect them from, uh, or that will change their beliefs. So no, that was my point. So There are even more direct cases, though, aren't there? Like the William James type cases or uh, to simplify a case where it's something like there's a, a gap that I want to jump and it's a large gap and I've ever jumped before. If I will myself strongly enough to believe that I can jump it, that may be the only, only um, condition under which I actually can succeed in jumping it. Mm -hmm. So then there is no analogue there to looking and finding what my bank balance is, right? That so they, the, the belief is, is as it were actually self-fulfilling in that right. kind of case, is it not? Uh, yeah, that may be true, but it still doesn't mean you can just choose to believe it. Um, well, so some people just can't believe, you know, just, some people are disposed to believe nice things about themselves, like they can jump big gaps, and other people aren't. There are some interesting studies about this, confirming the point that optimism is, in a slightly misplaced sense of your own abilities and so on, can be quite helpful in getting to act in ways that are successful. But interestingly, pessimists, people picked up as pessimists, turn out to have a much more accurate view of reality. Uh, this oh. is quite funny. But, the, but the problem is that pessimists may, some, in having that allegedly accurate view of this allegedly separate reality from themselves, may be cutting themselves off from the possibility of actually being able to succeed in doing certain things 
just on just on the basis of believing that they can. Well, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, for example, if you think you're good looking, you on the whole are slightly better looking to people. You know, that kind of comes out, confidence comes over. So people who overestimate their beauty probably are, because of that, slightly more attractive. But I don't know that you can choose to overestimate your beauty. That's why I'm saying I think it's kind of dispositional. But I, I don't think it really matters for my overall image anyway. Now, on, right, you had two part questions. Why does the truth not be, need protected? Why is it not? Yeah, and, well, I, for the obvious reason that, I guess I hope it's obvious, that, or maybe I'm wrong, that if you test true propositions, they stand up to test. They are confirmed. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they're confirmed or they're not refuted. They, I mean, you, if I've got a true opinion, uh, you know, the evidence isn't going, real evidence, I mean, proper evidence, isn't going to refute it. Is this straight just on this? Yes. Uh, uh, may I? Yeah. Right. Now, I mean, this is obviously analogous to the um, idea of free trade. I mean, given that the free market which functions, then uh, free trade will produce the best overall consequences. And of course, we also know that, as a matter of fact, I mean, this, this also uh, presupposes, assumes that uh, all the agents on the market uh, are roughly in the same situation. So that there are, say, no... You the economic theory of when free trade works. Right, yeah. I mean, so there are no, say, structural reasons which uh, make it impossible for certain uh, agents to, to compete on an <coughs> equal basis. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, similarly, of course, your model actually assumes that there's, you know, an ideal free competition. Uh, uh, and now, then that's the question, well, do, do, do the present societies measure up to this standard? Well, two, two things. Um, I'm not using that uh, metaphor of free market as part of my argument. Right? So it's just for illustrative purposes. So I'm not saying that, I'm not going, my structure of my argument isn't beliefs are like companies. Mm. Uh, companies should be eliminated when they're inefficient. Beliefs should be eliminated when they're true. I'm not doing an argument like that. I'm just kind of saying it's similar. However, I will now defend it. Uh, I don't subscribe to the theory that free markets only work when there's not an asymmetry between the participants. So the in fact the classical the, the, what became the classical theory of free markets under the Chicago School uh, is almost I mean I really don't understand how it became dominant because it's crazy. Uh, it, it, it doesn't no market in the history of the world has ever resembled the free markets as described under um, the Chicago School idealization. The, but the arguments in favor of free markets arose uh, long before the Chicago School, and they arose mainly from observation about what happens uh, under imperfect, real human situations in which you know, there's all these shortcomings like asymmetric information, um, not perfectly substitutable products, so on and so forth. And uh, the argument of at least one school is that what's good about the market, and this gets back to ideas, is that they reveal, they're actually a mechanism for revealing inefficiency. It's not, it's not that everybody goes in with all the information required to make the right decisions, they go in partially ignorant, and the mechanisms in the market provide information. In fact, if you read Hayek, Frederick von Hayek, his work about, he actually often explains how markets work by using intellectual progress as his example. So he starts the other way around. He says, look, you want to understand how a market works, think about what happens in ideas, and the way ideas compete, and then some win out and go ahead. And he talks about, he, he thinks of companies as little experiments. They're like a little scientific experiment. Put all the resources together in a certain way, get new kinds of products in a new way. Some turn out to work really well, some don't. But you eliminate the ones that don't work, and then the ones that do work thrive. And people learn from that, and they do more and more experiments. So he thinks of, them, of free markets as kind of like an a process of scientific experiment. And what they need in common, what ideas and markets need in common, is that the failed experiments get eliminated, and that the <coughs> companies are properly tested against each other. Protectionism in economics is an attempt to stifle that, to stop that. To say, 
If though this company is a disaster zone, though it is wasting resources on a mammoth scale, we will keep it going by confiscating resources from somewhere else and giving them to it. Intellectual situation is similar. You say, here's a, you know, I'm thinking mainly here of religions, obviously. Um, you know, these crazy systems of belief that can't stand up to any scrutiny. And then we get all those kind of mores, social mores of courtesy, laws like you mustn't cause racial, you mustn't hurt their feelings, that start, you know, make it harder to not get, get rid of these wrong ideas. We don't want it to be hard to get wrong, wrong ideas. We don't want it to be hard to get rid of inefficient companies. That's, uh, that's where the metaphor comes in. So I don't, the fact that there's asymmetries is exactly where we start from. There are bad companies, they're ignorant managers. They're doing a bad job. They don't have good information. They should lose up to the knowledgeable managers. There are ignorant people with bad theories. They should lose up to the smarter people with better theories. And that's how it works. It doesn't require that everybody's equally clever that everybody is in an equally good position to do well. There's going to be carnage along the way. Theories eliminated, people's feelings hurt, but it's all, it's all good in the long run. I have two concerns. Uh, uh, one, I'm worried about the woman at the uh, crosswalk who doesn't see the car coming. Uh, and I'm worried about her because she also doesn't believe it's coming. Uh, I, she doesn't see it, she doesn't the same thing with the person in the bank who you say uh, uh, chooses not to believe that uh, um, what the money is, how much money they have, as though if they did see what their balance was, then they would believe that that was their balance, as though there was some kind of issue as to whether the bank was giving them the right information. Just as the woman, well, I see a car, but I also believe it. Hang on, she didn't. No, no. I, with my Forget about she the bank. Look, yeah, it's it's a, a woman at the. <coughs> she doesn't see. Oh, people often don't see things. In fact, I saw one of those killed today. Uh, you just, I don't. Well, I, mean, I don't mean she looked at it and didn't believe it was coming. I mean, she didn't look. Yes, that's what I just said. She didn't. Right. She didn't see it coming. Mm -hmm. So you said she didn't believe it was coming because she didn't see it. Yeah. That's what I'm quarreling with. with, with mm -hmm. you, I don't think she didn't believe it was coming. I didn't think she saw, she saw it was coming. There was nothing for her to believe or not to believe. Yeah, there was no need to have a relationship with her. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Well, she had to believe. You no choose to believe that she believed. So do you think people would step out of the road if they, unless they believed she believed? The test is the action. She wouldn't step into the road if she thought or she'd seen it done. I changed her mind. I changed her beliefs. But she wouldn't have looked at it. No, she saw it. I'm not just, just making this up. Isn't this a semantic quibble? I mean, so it's semantics. It's yeah. Right. But but yeah. I mean, she she would her degree of belief in the proposition there's a car coming was very low, and therefore her degree of belief in the proposition that there wasn't a car coming is very high. That's all I need. Well, the other concern I have is unrelated, and that's the, the tension that we've been experiencing for many years between collectivism and individualism, if you want to put it in those terms. We like to believe we are a community, so the collectivist impulse is present in, say, controlling speech or, or yeah. in, in uh, um, acting like we're a family. But we know, actually, that we are discrete, atomic entities who are interested only in our own ends and have no sense of community at all and don't act from community impulses. And I don't see how we can choose one rather than another. I think there is a tension which is inescapable between those two. Yes, we're an individualistic society with a deep longing for a more collectivist or communitarian mm -hmm. aspect. And if you emphasize one, you leave out the other. And it's that tension that is present when people want to protect a minority group that has historically been exploited and has, continues to suffer by at least pretending that we're taking care of them in some way. Uh, uh, well, I, I, like to, yeah, I, I can't get what you're getting at, uh, but let me just make two historic points about the connection. So in the, uh, let's say, the 1950s, when Britain 
was probably uh, cheerfully state going down the statist road, right down the collectivist road. And now we, you know, we're still collectivist, but it's, it's a lot more, un people aren't so sure of it. But back then, there was far less concern about protecting people's ideologies and minority groups and all that kind of thing. So, in fact, one of the strange <coughs> these so-called new labor parties, which have sprung up all around the world, like in my homeland, New Zealand, we had one uh, for about nine years, and you had one in the States under Clinton and then Blair. They, they moved away from, a little bit, they moved away from the collect economic collectivism of the more traditional labor movement. But they got very, very concerned with what you might call ideological legislation. So, you know, the stuff around gay rights and all that kind of thing. And so, in some ways, I'm not sure that it's quite historically right. I think the, the right, this stuff about protecting people is almost, it's somewhere in between individualism and collectivism. It's like multiculturalism or something. So the idea that it's not, we're not all one great in it together, but there are these special groups, and they must be, I don't know, supported, privileged, helped in some ways. But it almost arises out of the, uh, almost in some ways arises out of a more individualist uh, tendency. For example, you don't see these things in the Soviet Union and so on. Then I'm going back even further in history, go back to the, uh, the 19th century, we had a very laissez-faire political structure, but you had organic communities still a little bit more intact. And, uh, Again, you didn't have, so you really did have a sense of community, I think, in a lot of places. But again, you didn't have uh, the, these legal te tendencies. And I guess it's partly because you had very homogenous populations um, and homogenous ideologies. I mean, homogenous in terms of race and, and belief. Not everybody's a Christian or something. So the felt need for this kind of protection didn't even arise. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think. You know, even I, I'm, as you can probably guess, not a collectivist in any part of politics. But I think that even if you are an economic collectivist, you don't need to be an intellectual collectivist. So, a, you know, up until the 1990s, a lot of people on the left were economic collectivists, but really fiercely protective of um, what you might call civil liberties and freedom of speech and, and they were anti censorship. And, uh, in fact, that stuff was more important to them almost than the economics. And there's been a strange migration on the left where they've become a little bit less collectivist economically, but a little bit more interventionist uh, ideologically. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's complicated. It's very complicated. But personally, I'm, I like the low levels of intervention everywhere. But, Jimmy, isn't, isn't the essential worry that some of us may have with your talk, that, which is about this idea of intellectual protectionism, that the idea of intellectual protectionism is basically um, a liberal idea. In other words... Well, yeah. one in the American modern sense of Hillary Clinton liberal, or in the... In the kind of, yeah, in the kind of broader sense of liberal political philosophy. So for those of us who are not, who are not uh, liberals, but are some kind of communitarians, mm -hmm. we don't have this problem, because we don't think that people, uh, that it's kind of obvious that people should have some kind of area where they're sort of, you know, mutually kind of bounded off from the state and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, so. And doesn't that, isn't it that kind of problem that is a, 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 a result of, uh, of the political philosophy of liberalism that then, that then leads to more specific problems, such as, for example, people can say, not just, I've got a right to my own opinion, but I've got a right to burn crosses on your lawn and so on and so forth. Don't all the, many of these kinds of nasty cases that you're going to get presented with follow from the political philosophy of liberalism, which you, which you start from, which is, which is not compulsory? Okay, so you mean liberalism in the John Stuart Mill sense? Yeah, right? something like Not that. Yeah. Yeah. Sense. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. Liberalism in that sense tolerates unpleasantness for the sake of uh, the sake of the information it gives up for the sake of progress, you might say. Uh, so it takes the view that <coughs> We don't have all the answers. We don't know exactly. Uh, and, and, it, uh, and it says, I know, you know, there are going to be stuff will happen we don't like, for sure. But in the long run, we'll be better, we'll be better off not trying to stifle every little thing we don't like. In the long run, the results of liberty will be better. 
so you don't, it's not utopian. I mean, it is absolutely not utopian. It acknowledges that we're, but then says utopia is, you know, most of the people say utopia is impossible, and the attempt to achieve it is going to be much worse than letting things go and having a pretty good non utopian world. So I agree. So, I mean, if, you, if, you were, if, you're, if you're not a liberal in the first place, so, which means you're not, you're inclined to think that the, the some set of people now knows how society should be arranged, knows what opinions people should hold, knows how they should conduct their lives, then there's no, if, if you were right about that, if those people really did know that, then fine, legislate it all. Force everybody to live that way. It's just that I don't think anybody does. All through history, there have been people who thought that they had got there, and they keep trying to force their ideas onto the whole population. And it's always a disaster. Oh, do people have the right to the truth? Yeah. No. I mean, <laughs> the thing is, again, if you, suppose you said, yeah, children have a right to know the truth. Well, then you'd have to set up some government agency that's going to list the truths and impart them to the children. Uh, Is that FC? <laughs> I would rather see a system of where you get... I mean, imagine you had a no national curriculum and you had a lot of competition between providers of... Uh, independent providers of education. You would find a lot of people would send their children to dud schools. Uh, and what would happen is that it would become apparent pretty quickly that they were dud schools because people would come up unable you know, to offer up to the people who will consume their education anything of any value. And some schools would be brilliant. And, we would have, and, and you know, then people would start sending the school kids to the better ones and it would all work out wonderfully. Uh, well, not perfectly, I don't want to say perfectly, but it would work out, would, information would arise. You would find, that, now, that, 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 that system, no information can get up. All we know is how the national curriculum works, and we've got nothing to compare it to. I mean, that's just one example, but that assumes that people, you know, there would be half a dozen schools that people had to choose, that every person had to choose from, mm -hmm. you know, within, within well, the area that their children could, you know, it's, it's like introducing the market on the rail network or internal markets well, in not, hospitals. Well, not it's, really. it's like, you know, markets work in certain demarcated yeah. areas. And they work very effectively in those areas, but you put them in other areas, you shoehorn them into other areas, they don't work. The idea that you could have enough schools whereby market principles would mean that the best school would. So what about curriculums? So, what about this? Just suppose, that, suppose we just have state schools and they've all got, they can all make up their own curriculum and set their own. Now, uh, you're not going to get, and you can't even move your kids, right? You can't move your kids from one school, now they're stuck in that school. What would still happen is that you would still you'd soon see that God, that school with that curriculum is doing much better, and the parents would start militating for the curriculum to be in that school. And, I mean, I'm not even where you can't. Or, or take another case. So take a case you had private education companies. So you had a whole lot of companies, and they could tender to run schools with school boards. Again, maybe you couldn't move your kids physically, but the parents could say, no, we want that company, they're, they're a better company, they do a better job. Isn't uh, that the system only needs so long as you're prepared to sacrifice a certain number of children yeah. and doom them to receive bad education to the benefit of subsequent generation of children who want people know which schools are good? Yeah. I, mean, the, the, I, mean, I would be willing to do that. And, uh, well, you're sacrificing almost all of them. So, it, 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 what, oh, you, no. compared with what, you see, the problem that you get with these items is everyone says, oh, that, that, there's an imperfection in this system, this system you propose. Not every child will get a brilliant education. Well, is it every child's getting a brilliant education now? But the question isn't, the, the question is never, is the system perfect? Does the system give everything, everybody, is it utopian? This is, the question is, is it a significant improvement on the, alter, the available alternative? Yeah, but you set up a false dichotomy because what we have now, Okay. All right, it's not good, but that's not necessarily because of the system. Uh, it's because it's of, you know, the system. No, no. I mean, you, you could imagine you could imagine the same state system in place that's providing much better education. Isn't because it? the state systems can do much better than the British state system does. Yeah, yeah I agree with that. But right. I mean, it's really off the top of my head. <laughs> there's, there's, there's lots of hands got up, but we're now over half an hour beyond our designated cut-off time. So I guess the <coughs> cut-off. Uh, and we can carry on debating in a more informal locale if there are bubbles.
other thing. Uh, yeah, I was going to make some uh, right. announcements. Yeah. So, uh, but, so before we make some announcements, let's take the...